Okay, welcome back to our podcast. Today I'm joined with Eric Stone, a new up and coming author of Jumpstart Your Workplace Culture. And I actually spotted him on social media with his new book and, and was really uh, taken by the concept and, you know, wanted to invite him onto the show. So, Eric, welcome to the show. How are Frankie, you? Frankie, great to have a chance to be uh, talking with your audience. Things are great out in uh, Connecticut, a little cold. So it's starting to get a little cold over here. Yep, of course. What are you going to do? So, you know, let's jump right into it, Eric. So tell me a little bit about your journey to becoming an author and, and why you in particular are so passionate about this whole culture component. Like, where, where does that call? Yeah, let, let, well, let me start way back then. So I got I got to start with, you know, my, my dad was a textile salesman. And he used to come home on these long trips and I would always eavesdrop at a young age to hear about the ebbs and flows of all the things going on on his trips, all the difficult clients, great clients. Mom was a school teacher. She was big on coaching, training, developing care factor, I guess, kind of the head and the heart in the in the family with those two mm -hmm. and always love business. And so, you know, I was the guy who had his odd jobs business with his buddies and always doing something and then went to school to study business always fascinated with what leaders do to create a, a group of individuals to come together and do something pretty special, whether it was sports or in business. Graduate from, graduate from college, uh, I wanted to be the GM of the Boston Red Sox, but they were not hiring, so I, I couldn't do that. Though they just hired someone now, which was kind of a bummer. I, sh I should have applied. And, uh, and landed in a company called Enterprise at that time, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, which became Enterprise Holding, they just did a name change to Enterprise Mobility, an amazing, really large, one of the largest privately held companies in North America, and got really lucky wow. to start as uh, one person of four in a brick and mortar store, climb that corporate ladder, enjoyed every bit of learning from people and adapting my leadership skills. And 26 plus years later, it was an amazing experience. And I felt I had a message to give based on the success our team was having. And so based on that message, instead of impacting maybe a, a couple hundred employees, I wanted to have a chance to impact tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of people. And so the question I used to get asked a lot, Frankie, in my interviews as I was climbing is, what are you guys doing to create this unique sales service culture within the organization? And so it always yeah. stood in the back of my mind. I felt I had something to give, and this is my chance to do some give back. So that's the latest of how I decided. I never thought I'd write a book. I'm not like you. You got a couple. This was my first. So I just thought I'd do it. Right. Well, that's how it starts. You got to start with the that's first right. one. Once you write a book, though, that you, you, nobody writes one book. Not not in my experience. Right. Unless something you know crazy happens. But you're going to write more books. I'm not, I have no doubt of that. So let me ask you this. The um, the culture piece, what you associate growth and success for the most part back to how the culture is how healthy the culture is. Is that essentially your thesis? Yeah, uh, cu culture truly becomes the the, uh, the catalyst to executing the strategy, you know, so. so. So, okay, so culture. Talk about an overused word right now, right? And so what the hell does culture mean for you? And, and, and I'm sure this you go deep into the book. I haven't had a chance to get a copy of it yet. Uh, but, you know, culture, people are defining that a lot of different ways. And essentially it's the people and the... I guess the vibe or, or the, the, the mantras or the focus or yeah. where, where do you, where See, do you it's funny. I, I actually look at it in a sense that way, but, but very different. So, you know, the easiest way to do it is it's, it's your, it's your, it's your behaviors in action. You know, at the end of the day, what are the behaviors your employees are, are, are doing when the leader's not in the room? Very similar to branding. You know, when yeah. you think of your personal brand, it is what people say about you when you're not in the room. And culture are those behaviors when the leadership team is not in the room and what, what is happening. And to me... Interesting. That's a great definition. Thank you. So it's behaviors and actions when the leader's... Correct. In the room. Yeah. So... Yeah. Yep, so and then and then you build off this. It's kind of like I said, even through my parents, like this head and heart approach, this ability to have an empathetic viewpoint with a high accountability uh, end result, you know, high character with high standards, you know, relationships with results. And so to me, culture became the shock absorber within my team that allowed us to get through the difficult times. It allowed my team to execute those behaviors, you know, as I would say, lather, rinse and repeat, because it was something that we trained. I believe you can train your culture. 
if you, if if they yeah. are in fact behaviors and behaviors are molded, then you can train those things. And so, I, and I truly always talk about throughout the book these five factors that you know companies should use when they're designing an engagement strategy, which is a huge piece of workplace culture. Yeah, that's unbelievable. So how do people? How do leaders? You know where where do they start as far as you know figuring out what the heck is the behavior and actions happening when they're not around? So yeah, you know I I use a simple nanny cam. It's like a nanny cam. <laughs> no, well, well it's, you're not in nanny cam spy. I, I oh well, only sometimes, only some no. Yeah, that could be interesting. Maybe you buy a package deal with the nanny cams. So you can know for sure what's happening. That, well, that, well, that's where you count on your culture carriers that I talk about. You know, you have those people in your organization okay. who are really those who live those values, execute those behaviors on a consistent basis, who are really your voice and voice of reason throughout the organization. And so I use this simple, simple. It's funny. I even have this from a game. It, it's an it's an hourglass. And, and when you think of an hourglass. Okay. Um, up at top. So at the top of the hourglass is really what do leaders do? They start pulling from their board, from their stakeholders, their clients, customers, whoever it may be to gather that information that people need to know where we're going. And as it pulls through, you'll kind of see the hourglass. I'm going to put this down because you got the visual. But as the hourglass right. comes out on the top part, is where you're pulling all of the commitments together on what we're going to do as an organization until it squeezes right in the middle where the sand comes out. That is clarity. That is the three priorities that everybody within the organization from new hire to of the person who just retired is going to understand. And then once you have clarity, you're coming out. So you're now going to reinforce through training and development and coaching. And it's part of your review process, these critical components. Okay. As yeah. this, go ahead. But well, no, no, no. Keep okay. Going, going. So, so then as it lands, right? So as, as the, it eventually lands on the bottom is where you're going to assess through whatever your organization assesses. It could be an engagement survey, pulse survey, however you look to gather data to have a baseline of how things are going. Now, the thing about an hourglass, and it's an hourglass, meaning in the word hourglass, we have the word hour, right? It's everybody pulling together. Right. It is not an eyeglass, which I had since I was seven. Like that's not, it's not about eyes. So when it, when you, right when you think you have it through that hourglass approach, technology happens, a pandemic happens, something happens where you just it it you turn it over again. and you're going to have, and so, but the essential piece is the clarity component in the middle and being able to get to that is what your book is yeah, about. Yeah. It is about how do you have a consistent message that ripples through your organization that people get excited about doing it? How many people, Frankie, do you know who are miserable at what they do? Not, or not how they do it, but where they work. percent on average, but on the high side, 89%. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, you didn't yeah, want an exact That's number. right. <laughs> so, yeah. But, but you're right. And so these factors are key drivers that organizations can design their strategy to, to start with the people human centric approach. And that is a simplified metaphor, which I talk about throughout the book. I love it. So essentially what you're doing is you're, you're identifying um, these three pillars. That's the first part of the process, I guess, in the book, right? Is how do you get the data to get to nail the three things that are actually going to make a difference? Yeah, it, it would be how do you gather and commit the right information and weed out addition yeah. by subtraction, you know, less is. This isn't like go to chat GPT or ask, ask your golf buddy what the three <laughs> yeah. things should be and then let's just push yeah. it down. Because I think that's where a lot of people get it wrong, right? Isn't that where a lot of leaders get it wrong? They've got their three pillars, yeah. you know, whatever it is. And they're like, Here's what we're going to do now. These are clearly important to the world, you know, whatever those are. And they're not actually crowdsourced yeah. at all. Yeah. And so they, it's the, the, that, that's why it, it's the adoption rate and the alignment is so crappy because you're not using the right data to make that initial decision on what clarity yeah. looks like. You know, two important things about the hourglass, by the way, Frankie. So, so uh, usually there's like a, on an hourglass, there might be a pillar on each side, pillar to the left or mission, vision, values, which guide your decisions, pillar on the right that holds up that hourglass or your policies and procedures that are flexible to make sure that you can execute your plans. So you got those pillars and those help you make your decisions that guide you to the right path. Every decision has to be part of within those confines. 
Interesting. All right, so let's talk about the transformation part. So if you're coming into a company or you're doing a keynote or things like that, what are what are the things that you do in the limited hour class that you have to, to speak? What is What do you feel like the top things are to, to, to create that transformation in an hour? Yeah, I would say it starts with what is the organization doing to create a strong relationship throughout the organization? And for everyone I mentioned, there will be tucked three initiatives that need to be under each one. So not just me having a relationship with you, but throughout the entire organization. What are those things that you do from the beginning of the employee journey? Then you got to make sure what are you doing to create clear communication of expectations and goals. You go through organizations, I think it's only 40% of the people understand what's expected of them. What are you going to do to ensure that that happens? Three would be, you know, the coaching, training and development. Are you providing the right material and equipment and information in order to have the desired outcome? I can't tell you how many leaders just expect the VP of sales to just get the job done. You know, sometimes people need information. I hired you too is not a good response. You know? Yeah. I heard you. Yeah, so, so it's funny. It's not a good response, but it's always yeah. the response. And then you go into personal and professional development. What are the things that you're doing to encourage both of those through an organization? Lastly, how do you recognize effort but reward high performance? And if you put within those in that hour talk, those five components and building and designing an engagement strategy, engagement really helps you get strong business outcomes. It leads to strong business outcomes. That's a good place to start. And does your talk shift if they invite you to talk to the whole company? Well, it can shift to whatever the at the end of the day is what do you want in these hours, 60 minutes, 40 minute talk that is going to be very impactful to you. So most of my talks, I do the outreach to usually the CEO leaders, as well as those who are kind of running points. So I do a lot of research before, but really it comes down to yeah, what are you good. looking to do and get out of this? And my last one I, that I've just uh, inked, it was... Well, first of all, why are you charging what you charge? <laughs> so, well, why should I charge you? But it was really coming back to a response of what do you want the audience to get away from? Who is the audience? And so it definitely varies. But these five factors, what's really, it's simple, not simplistic to execute. Your employees are going to want to know that they're part of an organization that does it. The top has to some way find a way to th put this within the organization. So it's a simple message that technically both groups would really enjoy. Yeah, and I think something to think about as you're, you know, I know you're new to the book and you're new to keynoting, something that, that, that to think about that could be really a great part of your new calling in business is this idea that you do multiple sessions with the C-suite and all that to see if you can identify this before you even do a talk. And then essentially the talk becomes a talk to the whole company that includes the journey that you had with the C-suite to come yeah. to it as you're layering in these things. Because I think essentially... If your talk can help align the company, that's going to and align the culture. That's the most powerful thing you can do, especially if you. But that will require a little more research and customization up front than most. But that could be your 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 real searing edge if you think about. And then then you all then you have even funny anecdotes or or things that are about the journey of how you got there with their leadership. And and so they the the trust that you can build very fast in a situation like that. I can't even imagine how powerful that would be for yeah. an audience as you're taking them through the journey of where the company's going they leave with hope they trust you they they're excited that you came in and, and you that we and then as like the conference goes on you've got the the ceo and everybody reinforcing that i think that to me if you're gonna bring a, a whole company together is probably the most powerful thing. Yeah, no, that, that that's a great call. And, and that's what, frankly, that's what I enjoyed through my old, whole corporate career is really the understanding that top part of the hourglass to truly pull in. Hey, talking is great and I love being a motivator that can inspire, but at the same time, that's not all I'm trying to do. It can't last for 60 minutes. I would love them to take something right. that in three months mm -hmm. from my talk, it's just a follow-up or in a month and you literally go through the road. Right. That's something I wanna do with the book is I wanna be part of their journey. So when you buy the book, I want to have a capacity that I'm with you as long as you read it. And I can answer hopefully questions you might have. I want to go along the journey as these people read it through a company. I love it. Look, I think at the end of the day, you know, one of the big things that is so important is making sure that the, tra the expected transformation is clear when it comes to this stuff, you know, so 
that that to me is important. I love that I love that you're putting it into the book because at the end of the day, companies and organizations and they're they're desperate right now for for how to jumpstart this thing. Yeah. You know, and they don't know they, a, a lot of times they don't really know where to start, especially the companies that already have a lot of this stuff, like the the templated stuff in place. Yeah. Right. Like they've already got the consultants, they've already got the learnings, they've already got all this stuff in place. And it's still stale. Is that one of your specialties where you yep. come into those existing situations that already have what they th every box checked in their mind, and they're still scratching their head on why isn't? It yeah, it, it really becomes how do you create some excitement over the same old, same old? And the truth is, is once you master the same old, I used to call it the behind the back pass. You know, before we get too creative. Wait, were you a basketball player? I, well, I attempted to be one. I attempted to be one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> old, you want to be Pistol Pete? Oh, you got to love Pistol Pete. That's a, is that a Louisiana yeah. reference right there? LSU, right? That's just a, no, that's just a legendary behind okay. the back. Okay. Okay. So, well, didn't he invent the behind the back or is that, I guess that's I would probably, well, he, if there's a guy who I would say who would do it, it would be Pistol Pete. That's for sure. But, pistol. The old pistol. But, All but, right. So you didn't quite make it to the pistol level. He, but you still like the yeah, behind the I, back. Yeah, I had like the pistol part. Like I was the little guy, the pistol, little pistol guy maybe who turned it over when I went behind the back. You know, I, but. Yeah, exactly. You did the behind the back, but it was, it was a game. I mean, it was right. Back. But it looked you, great. It looked great. That's right. It, it was well said for sure, you know. But when I think to your point, I mean, th that's what I think organization, it gets very stale. And how do you bring an initiative with a little spice on it? Because you always have to constantly be looking ahead and saying, hey, what, what do we do next with this? And so because people in who are the operators get a little bored at, at the thing. And it's just like a meeting. I mean, meetings are boring unless you mix up the meeting. And so are initiatives unless you mix up the initiative. And so you got to have to master that art of how do we find ways to not only once we make the change, because everyone can change, how do we actually thread it through the organization? So I, I'll give you a quick example. So, and I won't go too much into the, the Johnny the Bagger story, but this was just a great, have you ever heard of it? Right. Johnny the Bagger? Johnny the Bagger? It's, why is that? Sound I don't funny? know. I don't know. You remember, maybe long story short, I'll, I'll do the abridged version, right? Johnny the Bagger is his right. bagger who uh, listened to this consultant, did an inspiring speech to this grocery store chain. And the consultant was saying, each and every one of you can make a difference. You know, how? Well, by putting your mm -hmm. personal signature on every interaction. So Johnny the Bagger, a month later, is inspired, reaches out to the consultant and says, you know, hey, at first I didn't know what I could do. Now, Johnny also proudly said that I, he has Down syndrome and he thought he was just a bagger. And so he says, at first, I didn't know what I could do until I thought about it with my father. And what we decided to do is come up with a thought of the day. Every time I grip, you know, bag someone's groceries, I'm going to put a thought of the day and make it a different experience. Well, fast forward a couple of weeks after that conversation, store manager comes in, can't believe the line behind Johnny's line. It's down to the frozen food section. Managers triaging. They're like, wait a second. This is it's too busy. We're going to mess things up. One of the customers says, hey, don't worry, manager. I'm here for Johnny's thought of the day. 10 people back, lady says, I used to come here once a week. I now come here every time I'm in the area just because I want to get Johnny's thought of the day. And so, well, that sounds great, right? That's pretty impressive. Well, another month ha uh, passes by. Store manager calls uh, the consultant says, you won't believe what's transformed in our organization. The flower department now takes an unused corsage, broken flower, and pins it to that young child, elderly individual to make their experience better. And so the point is, wow. so, okay, so you take that story, an organization who is struggling with customer service needs to understand what are the behaviors that have to happen within this company that I'm part of. And so what we do is we say, well, let's make sure this is a new hire training video, step one. These are the behaviors that it should be looking like in our experiences. You need to try to become the Johnny the Bagger. It is then tucked into several different modules to remind people what it's like. They didn't stop there. They use it for their weekly customer service groupings, which they say, hey, Frankie, you're my Johnny the Bagger of the week. The Johnny the Baggers who have the most nominations get submitted up the company. Once a month, they select the Johnny the Bagger award. That is then recognized throughout the company at a dinner that they have 
together. They didn't stop there. We then said, okay, how do you take that? Well, that's got to be part of the review process. If we're trying to change the experience, yeah. we've got to put it in our employee reviews. So what do they do? It's under the other column of an experience or changing the experience. It's the Johnny, the bagger. That's where people fall short. They just talk about it maybe once or twice. They don't thread it through every possible way. It's hard not to know in that organization who Johnny the bagger is. Wow. So it was actually the bagger. He was actually place. the bagger. <laughs> That's what you're trying to do. I thought it was going to be, a, I thought it was supposed to be another one of the uh, like legend basketball players. <laughs> Johnny, yeah. This is Johnny the bagger. Yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> no, that, no, no. No, that's yeah. beautiful, man. So that's interesting. And, and where did you come up with the story, Johnny the Bagger? Is that just like one of those ones that's out there? You know there? what's out there? And it was one of those things. You talk about how do you gather information? I challenged uh, one of the regional managers at that time to go find something that would change someone's, the way they handle an interaction. That regional manager is the one who found it. We then just tucked it in. It was just wow. online waiting for someone to utilize that. So yeah, it was using your team, which I call. If you remember earlier, those quote unquote culture carriers. So we were trying to get some carriers out. Mm -hmm. I love that. So, you know, one of the biggest things that I, when you're doing this kind of work is, is, is really like engaging the people that are already kind of feeling like burnout or they've all heard it all before. And uh, here comes another speaker. Here's another conference. Let me just go to this and at least I can go to the pool at some <laughs> right. point yeah. or, I, or I get a free dinner. Which, how do you deal with those folks? You know, how do you, how do you help those ones believe again? I mean, uh, 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 it's stories that connect. And uh, to, to, to me, it's about pulling from the emotion. What makes the hour hard is, you know, in most times in business, when you're guiding a company or you're part of the company, you have some time to, to uh, change people's mindsets and behaviors. You just have to be very mm -hmm. effective in a one hour thing that is going to pull the heart of an emotion, which is actually why I like pulling from Johnny the bagger because that's attitude, effort, and coachability. That's all that is. I mean, it's nothing crazy. You yeah. don't have to be, um, you know, Pistol Pete to do that. You, you can be Johnny the bagger and do that. And so you have to find different uh, ways to, to pull their emotion, in my opinion. No, I love that. You know, and, and, and I think at the end of the day, the more people realize that they can, in fact, make more impact than they, they probably think, I think that that's an important message. I think most people think that, they're, that they, they really can't make an impact, so what's the point? I, I'll give you a great analogy. I mean, so I, I worked with, with a company uh, for over you know, two and a half decades, and we rented cars. I mean, you could look and say, hey, you rent cars. Well, we did so much more than that. And so when a new employee would come in, you have to kind of change that perception. We do so much more than that. And here's what we do. You had to change how people could be perceived at. We did much more than that. We were the, you know, that universal total transportation solution and making a difference there. And so everything was about having people. It's like the bricklayer parable. We, we, I'm sure you've heard that where, you, you know, guys walking by, you know, yeah. sees two people laying bricks. One says, I'm just laying bricks, just putting them together and cranking the cement down and laying mm -hmm. it down. The other says, I'm building a cathedral, you know, and so it's it's what's the difference between those two employees engagement? Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, the, people are desperate right now and people want more from their the companies and organizations you're kind of seeing this i mean is it realistic for companies to 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 be what's now the expectation of this new culture or this new generation coming yeah out? so so i'd say a few things to that that's a great point yeah you know, first of all you got five generations in the workplace you know so you got five generations you got yeah. to mix this talk about culture you've got all these great talents but different values that are based on each one of them and then you have this flexibility debate. Is it hybrid? Is it remote? Is it in person? And of course, the pandemic accelerates everything. And then there's, e and there's even more. And so, you know, you have this, which is what's put this topic so front and center. And so what organizations and employees have to figure out is who do I want to be? And you can't be everything to everybody. And that's the tough thing. And so what can't happen, and this is my biggest thing, Frankie, what, whatever you decide to do, whatever you decide, remote, hybrid, right. in person, whatever you're trying to align your culture with, it just can't, it can't create 
a worse customer experience, whatever that may look like. And so what I have found, I and I don't know if you've seen this too, is the experience has gotten worse. So, so I think companies are falling customer. short. Well, why are they falling short? Engagement's really low. It's the lowest it's been in a while. And that's a problem. And so- So you, the customer's experience with the company is directly tied to the culture as well, obviously, because it's the, they're interacting with the front line that's just- engaged. Yeah, I mean, when, when I talk about in my last chapter, the measurement or how do organizations measure culture, we double down on it, on the employee experience and customer experience. It is half of the equation that has to happen. And so really usually, in, and it starts always to me with the employee, which transitions into the customer, which eventually will help not just help the bottom line, but uh, move things in a very good direction. I love that. So let me ask you this. So it's something I, that I am big on, I'm, I'm an innovation speaker, right? So I, I speak on how to unlock continuous innovation in companies that are facing seismic shifts and massive change, disruption, which is essentially almost every company right now. Um, but you know, how do we, how do we go beyond just being content or happy or better and, and actually align with a battle cry to, to innovate so that the company isn't left behind or the people. So this idea of augmenting for a future where no one's left behind. And I have this thesis and one of my big talks is called love your weird. I don't know if anybody's mentioned that to you. So love your weird is actually the unsuspecting unlock to what is needed in the culture for unlocking continuous innovation. See, I believe that a lack of authenticity and the lack of imagination and the lack of generosity and selflessness across the whole company, especially from the top down, um, is what is limiting organizations from being able to unlock yeah. it. Now, the fun thing about- No, it, no, you go. Let me get your thoughts, you get your initial thoughts, and then I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about I well, well I, what I love about that is you go to kind of unlocking a potential in a different way. I, I'm trying to unlock the employee's potential that will change how the organization operates and pulling the best out of everybody to achieve that common goal mm -hmm. together. And I, like, I love that un unlocking kind of that weird or bringing out your weird. And that's what organizations have to do to bring, you know, a diverse group of individuals together, diversity of thought ethnicity, a generational thing to yep. pull, you always, we already learned, dude, you got to be ready for the unexpected. That's a chapter in the book. Like, what are you going to do when you got to be ready for it? And organizations yep. have clearly tried to adapt with what happened. And uh, so, uh, but go back to you. I, I want to hear what you're saying. Yeah. So that would, so that's the thing is like, essentially um, what I've realized is that love your readers is, is a fast way to cut into like, you know, just a simple fact that I, because I usually am talking to the, the whole organization or at a conference or to some big client like celebration thing. And essentially, it's the quickest way for the audience, the, the team members, the, the people that are actually part of the culture to, to get a sense of like, oh, wait a second. Our CEOs hired this guy? You know, really? This doesn't seem like our company, but but okay, I'm listening. And, and all of a sudden that becomes the gift that you can bring to help the leadership. Like I, I don't actually like doing talks to the leadership team. Not, not yeah. personally, because I feel like, I mean, yeah, I like to meet with them beforehand, but I'm like, let's talk, let's, let's do something here. Let's get your yeah. money's worth. And that's going to be with your people. Like get, giving you guys more ideas on where you're going to go strategy wise. Like I, that's my old life. Let's let's create a moment. Let's create a transformation. And I, I, what I find is that the love your weird is the is a quick like, oh, wow, well, that's different, you know, and, and th but what it does is it immediately disarms people because essentially loving your weird because a lot of people don't even know what that means. or they've spent two decades hiding their weird, you know, so it's like, you know, who is the weird? And what my whole thesis is that it's it's actually the, your five year old self is the easiest way to, like, figure that out. So. Eric, what were you into at five? Like, not necessarily what you want to be when you grow up, but like when you were five, when you played make believe. But what yeah, oh, well, that that's great, and, and it's so true when you reflect back. Uh, five, so was that a little pre first grade almost? I uh, I would well, yeah, and anywhere's in there. You don't have to get the you don't have to nail yeah, it yeah. exactly, but you know, back back before you you realized that make believe was ridiculous and you couldn't do that and you weren't going to fly to the moon or build a time machine, at least in my at, case. Listen, at uh, that age, I was yeah. probably making pretend I was flying around my house in a Superman cape, you know, because I don't know, maybe I wanted to be, maybe I thought I wanted to have a superpower, you know, maybe that was the reason who, who knows. Yeah. But the other 
thing, and I don't know if I'd call it weird, but define. So what defined me was I was always the smallest kid in my class. So so I had to learn, okay. which probably goes into why I love unlocking people's potential. I had to work so hard to just be as good as, um, and so, and I also was unbelievably competitive at five or six, believe it or not. I'll give you a quick story. I'm literally, I'm in the basement with my uncle and we're just messing around <clears throat> and I'm trying to, you know, we're playing uh, in between a doorway. We're trying to, you know, make pretend it's the world cup, I guess. And so we're just trying to yep. kick a ball uh-huh. and score past each other. So it's tie. <clears throat> he was probably letting me get it to a tie, but it was tie. Anyway, I, I sent a little rocket right corner and uh, and I score. Now, what, what what I didn't realize happened is my uncle was trying to do like a kick save in between a door and he busts up his kneecap. He starts screaming in pain. OK, my dad starts running downstairs. We're in the basement. And he says, Eric, what happened? And I go, I scored. What'd you do? I said I scored. <laughs> so so and of course, my uncle dislocated his kneecap. So there was always this little competitiveness a little bit of that within me. I probably need to learn how to be within my emotions, but so Superman or I was trying sport. You think so? I don't know about that. So here's my, here's my argument is that no, you don't. So no, you don't. What if I told you that everybody has a weird kid. They stop being those things. You stopped acting like you could fly or believing you could fly. Right. Or looking for supernatural qualities or superpowers. Everybody does that. Right. Because it's the way that our culture, our schools, our parenting, everything else, like just kind of suppresses that and gets us more into math equations and less into imagination. Now, if you look back, every single great thing that was created, innovation created was people that were willing to believe in something that didn't exist. And they were willing to to put imagination above knowledge. Right. Famous quote from like an Einstein, something like that. He says that knowledge, imagination is more powerful than knowledge. Right. And so my job is to remind people of of who they already are, the ones that feel stuck. So many people are stuck. They don't know what they're passionate about. They don't know who they are. It's like, all right, let's go back to five. Now, some people have a difficult time with that because of the trauma that happened between now and five. There's everyone has a different level of trauma that's happened. Right. Some much worse than others. So I always honor that. And that's where the authenticity comes in. It's like, there's a reason we stopped being our most raw, original imprint of our DNA. And that was because we thought we needed to be something different, right? And that was because of different things and traumas and pain that happened that made us change the way that we approach situations. So the first thing we have to do is not actually add anything. It's get rid of some things. Okay, so the first step is, is more about removing stuff than it is adding. And that's a huge, huge part of, of the journey. And I, I don't, I suspect that probably that journey is similar with what you do. And, and when you're unlocking cultures, because that's a big piece, right? But the one thing a lot of people don't know is that 98% of five-year-olds test at a genius level of imagination, according to NASA. Have you ever seen that? I, I have, I have not, I have not. Okay. So back in the late sixties, the, the, you know, the space race is full throttle. The United States government went to NASA asked and, and asked for a test for how to test adults for genius level of imagination. So they knew who to hire to make sure that the United States continuously innovated and didn't slip as a superpower, right? They made this test out of all the adults. There was over a hundred thousand adults, average age of 31, only 2% tested at the genius level. Now it was a simple enough test that they could give it to kids. So they gave it to 1600 five-year-olds and 98% of them tested. (laughs) It's crazy. (laughs) <laughs> it's wild. And and so what that tells me is that virtually all adults have it in them. They've just unlearned it because they wanted to figure out, is this something that you're born with or is this something you were taught or learned? It's clearly not taught or learned. Um, it's been unlearned. <clears throat> so a lot of my journey is to help individuals and organizations embrace and love the weird because here's the other thing about weird, right? It's not just that five-year-old original DNA that if we all show up with them, we're probably going to unlock quite an interesting, powerful, innovative culture. Uh, But not just that, which requires psychological safety and everything else. Now, here's the thing, though. As I started going deeper into Love Your Weird, which I started working on that about six years ago, and it was actually as I was going through my own inner child work, having gone through a divorce and some different things, right? Well, it turns out weird wasn't always spelled or meaned what it means now. So the original word weird was back in the 15th century is when it came out. It's not even in our dictionary. It was W-Y-R-D. So it was spelled different. And then Shakespeare with like Macbeth and stuff turned it into like the weird sisters and it was like twisted. 
into what we know it is now, where you look weird, you smell weird, and all this other stuff. And I, because I always kept on this journey, I was like, man, I'm not, I don't look that weird. And one, one of my big sayings is that you don't have to look weird to love your weird. But here's the thing the original word weird meant the power to control your fate, destiny, and supernatural qualities. Oh. You go, you're going right? back to shape. So all of a sudden it's not as weird. <laughs> I'm going for Shakespeare man. here. So, but that's the thing. I didn't, I, I accidentally stumbled onto this truth before I was all, I was already committed to the love your weird as an unlock renovation. And then, and then this, and essentially what it is, is it's, it has a lot less to do with like, Oh, ear piercings and, and the way I look and, and being whatever gender I want to be and everything else. It can be. And that's fine too. Of course we love that weird, but like, let's go deeper. Let's go deeper than that weird. And of course, we're going to love all the external weird. That's great. Cool. Thank you, Austin. Let's go deeper, right? And let's love our weird as it relates to our destiny. And, and what is Eric's supernatural quality? Because if you think about it, if everyone was hyper-focused on unlocking that thing that they were born yeah. to do, that is their unique supernatural quality, what could the culture look yeah. like? Yeah. No, I, I, I love how you – so what you, you have framed – I love how it goes back. It creates a a a real a story you can believe in. You know, you go back pre Shakespeare. Absolutely. You're coming up with like everything, and that's what organizations myth. It makes sense. What I love also is we both believe in this addition by subtraction, just a little bit differently. You know, my whole concept yeah. is whether I'm on a board or, or I'm working with a company. And I just try to say, what are your three priorities? And everyone gives me different things. Or I look at a policy and it's so complicated, no one's ever going to do it. So why, why, no wonder why there's no consensus. And it is, why are we not shrinking? Kind of like the clarity of the hourglass. Why are we not shrinking it to do just this? Focus. And so yeah. we kind of get there. And so you've thrown in Pistol Pete and like a Macbeth Shakespearean thing. So you got some deep talents. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, and, and they're 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 not your, who you're suspecting, right? Everybody throws in Oprah and Michael Jordan and stuff, and you know, you know all this nonsense, and it, you you get to a point where it's like, all right, let's you got to go beyond every story everybody's ever heard. And but the point is, is that you know, you, what's beautiful about the whole thing is, is this: everybody's been a five, which means everybody's been weird, according to yeah. adults. And so if we can create a culture where that's accepted, I mean, I think ultimately that's where else are we going to get to a, a place of imagining something novel that could actually help us become innovative again and grow and not get disrupted. I mean, people like to use these terms, but it's like, okay, how do we get there? Like, okay, great. We need to be innovative. Great. We need to make high revenue sales and all that. It's like, okay, now that we got that out of the way, how, how the hell are yeah. we going to do it? Yeah. Well, how the hell I are we going to do I, it? But there is so much truth when you go back to the thing you loved and enjoyed when you knew it didn't matter. And that's what the five-year-old does. Right. No one no one, yeah. no one cares. And it doesn't. They're just doing it. So for me, just so you know, I wanted to be an astronaut, a cowboy, a TV preacher, and an inventor at the <laughs> same time. Right? Of course, that's weird. Okay? And of course, you're, you're going to have a hard time doing that. Now, I didn't quit my job. Once I realized this six years ago, I didn't immediately quit my job and go work for space. <laughs> Right. I didn't immediately quit my job and work on yeah. a ranch. I didn't immediately start working exclusively in a lab. OK. And I also didn't become a TV preacher. However, I started to look for ways that I could bring that in. Right. So I I love horses and I, I try to spend time with horses. Now I wear cowboy boots every day. I invented a software since that time and eventually and in turn was able to from that that desire to invent something, created something I actually could sell and make a big exit on. Right. So that's fun. I, I, you know, I'm still working on the astronaut piece because, you know, you got, I'm on the waiting list for Virgin Galactic. <laughs> and then keynote speaking is the new church. I mean, let's face it. I mean, capitalism is the new religion in this country, whether you like it or not. And the best way to impact change is through keynotes. Yeah. So you, you start to look for it though. And you start, it, and it, and it's how do I introduce what I was passionate about? Because a lot of people I ask, especially women, they wanted to be a teacher. Right. And now they're an accountant yeah. or something, right? And so it's like, or they're in sales. And so, but then it's like, so it's not, let's not quit our job and get our teaching certificate. Let's see how we can use teaching, mentoring things. Like, how do we 
we got to just start trying to bring it forward and then make sure. So here's where the leadership does come in. Like they've got to be a part of the celebrating it and passionately trying to put all these ideas and imagination and authenticity that's going to come forth to work. <clears throat> well, I mean, you know? and that's the hard part about leadership. I mean, what, what you do is what everyone wants to get. I mean, everyone is trying to figure life out. I mean, you, we're all in this treadmill at times and we can't get off and, you, and you're trying to pause back to back to then and say, how do we, how do we do what we're really excited about? our weirdness and how do we leverage it? It doesn't mean like you said, become an astronaut. It's taking those, I mean, look at my parents, right? I took something from my mother from coaching and teaching and all that training stuff. And I took the, the sales negotiating business. Of and then I took this thing of, hey, I like how you get a group of people together and hence look look what happened. Well, and I, and we, and I always honor that and take some time in, in my talks to, you know, in the middle of every talk, we stop and everybody starts telling their neighbor what they were into at five. Yeah. That's every talk. And that's because I want to create this space and I want that space to be created on company time. And so that it's the first example of like, Hey, do we even know that this person wanted to be a Barbie cheerleader or whatever, <laughs> right, you know? Right. And, yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, you know, it comes out, you're like, Oh, that, that totally yeah, checks right. out. Yeah, Barbie <laughs> cheerleader. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's a fun thing. And it's like, we forget to have fun we, and, and we forget to be human. And, and I don't know, we don't know when we walk out of my talks exactly how we're going to yeah, use it. I, I love that. We just know that it matters to yeah. you. Well, you're bringing every, and I think you're making it important. memorable. I mean, that, that even that one instance of having people talk to the neighbor, again, it's spurring the message to come out. They will, they will not Absolutely. forget it. You know, one other point I agree with you, I wanted to get to too, is, um, the reason I actually like talking, at least with management and above, sometimes it's hard to get a whole company if they're a big company together, is when the managers and the leadership is in the room, it's, it's when you just talk to leadership, it can, it can end there. When you have the manager and leadership, yes. there's something that makes it a little bit more sticky. And then the, it kind of can bubble up and down. So that's why I do enjoy what you were saying. Mm -hmm. No, I love that. So I think at the end of the day, um, you know, you, 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 we want to create experiences. We don't have to have it all figured out to be able to impact change. In fact, you're better off not trying to figure it all out. And, and I think that that's where some people get it wrong is they, they get a little too granular. And while we want actionable things, some of this stuff is big change that needs to have a moment, an emotional moment tied to it to in, spark that change. That's why I loved the word jumpstart in your book. And the fact that you use the bumper cables, pull the book down. Let's grab that thing real quick so you can see it. There you go. Show them. The there you go. We'll see if it's all, there you go. I love that. You know, so you're actually electrocuting the coffee. That's a big, that's so, a big hey, deal. So you originally know? it was going to be the water cooler, but that wouldn't work well, right? You'd electrocute somebody. So I, I couldn't do the water cooler. So I needed another image. So what better of a workplace yeah. image? Than a, than a nice old coffee cup. But Jumpstart is a branding thing that could build into, to your point, hey, could there be another book? Well, Jumpstart is something that is kind of catchy and it's what organizations need right now with so much that has changed. You know, organizations were focusing on, let's call it six things. And then they had to dial it to just two things because there was a lot of pressure on employees. And now we've got to build back to where we were and better. And so Jumpstart is a nice little, um, yeah. I love it. All right, before you go, a couple of things. One, are you going to be sending jumper cables out to the your potential customers and, and uh, bureau agents? Because I highly recommend I, it. I, I, if you insist, I will do. Yeah, look, find some inexpensive ones that, you know, it's not too big of a deal. And I'm telling you, I think if you mail jumper cables, it's going to be hard to forget who Eric's. That's right. You know, I, that's a great point. That's a great point. No wonder why. That's, a free that's, okay. that's you, man. That's no one. Dude. Love your weird brother. We're going to innovate no matter what conversation we're doing it. We're dropping in. That's why I, I, I always like to let, you know, the, 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 the guy who comes on, tell us a little bit about your thing and then let's see how it all yeah. goes together. Love it. All right. So if we want to jumpstart our culture, where do we go? Is it Eric Stone? Yeah, you, you can go to, Eric Dash Stone, to you go to Eric D Stone .com, which will give you a little bit about the book itself and a few, a few D. things there. Okay. Uh, you could go on LinkedIn is probably a common place that everyone can just jump in. So I'd recommend those two are, are probably the, the easiest channel. Stick to those two that you could always email me at Eric. Uh, at 
And obviously you're with Amplify, which means your books are at every bookstore in America. So I got to share, Frankie, something that was really fulfilling and rewarding is, you know, I, I, I this was death by a thousand paper cuts. But but what I was able to do <laughs> is and thanks to a lot of people no. couldn't do it alone, is the Barnes and Noble colleges east to west. So from the Harvard's, Yale's and UPenn's and MIT's to the Midwest of Notre Dame and Northwestern all the way. I'm going to be out in Stanford in, in December and UCLA. Awesome. You know, so you're getting a lot of uh, uh, a lot a lot of opportunity because I love youth leadership. But the other thing is just also in the Barnes and Noble retail brick and mortars, which are two separate things, and slowly and methodically winning over some individuals. It's just a red hot topic. It's it's on everyone's mind. So it's been great. Yes, I love it. All right, buddy. Well, listen. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been an amazing time, and I'm so excited to share it with everybody. Um, you know. For everybody who's listening, check out Eric Stone or watching. And until next time, we excited to have you guys come back around for the next podcast. But this has been a great session. Thank you so you much. You bet. Enjoyed it a lot. Thank you, Frankie.